Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today we're going to be taking a look at Act 1, Scene 5 of Macbeth. Um, it's a really important scene, so I'm going to be dividing this into two. So today, taking a look at Part 1. The scene begins with Lady Macbeth reading a letter from her husband. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that the letter's written in prose. Perhaps to distinguish it from the blank verse or unrhymed iambic pentameter that characterises most speech in the play. But also, I would argue, it could allude to the madness of heeding the witches, given that one of the things that Shakespeare sometimes uses prose to do is to indicate the madness of a character that employs it. Macbeth's acceptance of his ambition and his passion in seeking to achieve uh, the kingship is evident in the powerful verbs that are employed here. He uses burned and wrapped to describe his feelings upon hearing the premonition of the witches. And uh, this is particularly important given that it kind of echoes what Banquo said in Act 1, Scene 3 when he witnessed Macbeth listening to the predictions. Uh, Banquo stated, he seems wrapped with all. And Macbeth recognises this in himself as well. This is something that absolutely grabs his attention. The conclusion of the letter demonstrates a love and compassion for his wife that's evident in the use of the superlative adjective dearest, my dearest partner of greatness. Uh, worth noting as well that this is a shared joy that he's talking about. Lady Macbeth is his partner of greatness and he's wanting to send this message to his wife uh, in advance of his imminent arrival so that thou might not lose the joys of rejoicing. He doesn't want her to have a second when she's not relishing the pleasure of being told that she might be queen one day, uh, that she might be ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. So there's an enormous amount of at least fondness for his wife that's evident in Macbeth's words. Uh, this is in contrast to what will follow from Lady Macbeth, who says, for example, I fear thy nature regarding Macbeth, and the way she essentially bullies him into the murder of Duncan. Lady Macbeth's use of modal verbs is interesting in conveying her certainty and arrogance. When she states, glams thou art, and cordial, and shalt be what thou art promised, She's not using and may be what thou art promised, could be what thou art promised. There's shalt, the archaic form of shall. There's absolute certainty there. When considering the character of her husband, Lady Macbeth states, it's too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Now, this phrase, the milk of human kindness, is one that we're familiar with, but is coined by Shakespeare. It has connotations of nurturing, and yet to Lady Macbeth, that compassion, that kindness that's evident in the metaphor, is a weakness in her husband. She seeks and admires strength. The nearest way, or the easiest way, for Lady Macbeth to achieve her ambitions of Macbeth becoming the king, is to commit murder. She knows nothing about the obstacle posed by Malcolm being named Prince of Cumberland. And perhaps more importantly, more significantly, she has none of the moral doubts that Macbeth exhibited in the previous scene. She just immediately thinks that the important thing, the necessary thing to do is to commit murder. But she doubts that her husband has the capacity to do that. She realizes that her husband has ambition something that um, is ultimately going to be his martyr, his fatal flaw. But she says he's without the illness should attend it. Um, she believes that ambition should be complemented by a kind of ruthlessness, a determination to act whatever the cost, an evil, if you like, um, so that whatever is desired to be achieved can be achieved. Um, and so something that would be regarded by most people as a positive aspect of Macbeth's character, that he's kind, he's caring, etc., is for her a flaw. He lacks the necessary illness in order to realise his ambition. And then we get another exciting little bit of chiasmus. Uh, thou wouldst highly, wouldst thou holily. So you get the inversion of thou wouldst and wouldst thou. And I think this sense of inversion complements the way that Lady Macbeth feels that Macbeth's um, ambitions are corrupted. They're turned on their head. They're inverted because he wants something highly. He wants high status. He wants to be king. But he wants to attain it through a moral approach. He wants to do it wholly, 
And that's something that she doesn't believe to be possible. Uh, she believes that the only way to achieve that as ambition, as we saw on the previous slide, is through the illness that should attend it, that um, he has to act in an evil way in order to achieve his goals. An alternative reading of Holy Lee is that it's an allusion to the divine right of kings, a belief that was maintained by James I. Essentially, the idea is that Macbeth wants to be king and also wants to be appointed by God. He wants to be a holy king, as Edward is later presented as being in the play. Uh, this is something that Lady Macbeth's plans just will not permit. If he's going to commit regicide, then clearly he's not appointed by God. In fact, he's inverting the great chain of being and going against the wishes of God. This recognition by Lady Macbeth of the tension in Macbeth's character between his ambition to become king and his desire to be righteous is also evident in her statement, what's not play false and yet what's wrongly win. Here she's asserting that Macbeth doesn't want to cheat, he doesn't want to deceive, he doesn't want to do the wrong thing, he doesn't want to play false, but he wants to win something that he doesn't have the right to, in this case, the crown, to be king. And it's this oxymoronic nature of those clauses that indicates Lady Macbeth's belief that Macbeth's position is falsely naive at best. He can't maintain these two contradictory positions. He can't be good and realize his ambition. So it's important to have um, a quick overview of the significance of euphemism. It's a term that uh, we're using here, but also it's gonna be really important in Act 1, Scene 7. Euphemism is a word or expression that's used to make a subject that's considered unpleasant or impolite more acceptable, usually socially acceptable. And so whenever we deal with subjects that are unpleasant, we tend to find that um, the English language has euphemisms for them. Good examples are references to death or urinating. So that, for example, with uh, being dead, you might use the expression to be at peace, to be at rest, or passed away. Whilst with urination, you might find something like to spend a penny, to powder one's nose, uh, to go to the bathroom even. All of these render something that could be seen as socially inappropriate or unpleasant or impolite a little more acceptable. The flip side of this is dysphemism. So dysphemism is when you render something that's uh, potentially unpleasant or impolite more unpleasant and more impolite. So for example with death you might have something like their worm food. With urination you might have something like I'm going to splash my boots. So it tends to make something even more unpleasant than it was originally. So Lady Macbeth's crystal clear on what she believes needs to be done uh, moving forward. And yet, throughout the soliloquy, and most clearly at this point, she uses euphemism to refer to the murder. Uh, we saw it earlier when she said that she believed Macbeth was too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. She doesn't say murder, but catch the nearest way euphemistically refers to it. Similarly here, we've got references to thus and that, etc., rather than a reference to murder itself. Regicide is simply too horrific to name, even for someone as evil as Lady Macbeth. When Lady Macbeth says, highly hither that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, she's essentially calling to the distant Macbeth, wishing him to return quickly so that she can make him listen to her. Uh, the key thing here is the power of her words, which she conveys through this metaphor of pouring spirits, those spirits being her language. Um, the fact that they're represented as a form of liquid shows that her words have substance, they have power, they have depth. And finally, she says that she will chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round. The synecdoche drawing attention to Lady Macbeth's words representing her bravery. The fact that it's her tongue that represents herself and it's her tongue, her words, her language that are her bravery shows that she will use that tool to criticize any worries and characteristics of Macbeth that might get in his way, that might be those obstacles that are referred to. Okay, so.